Queens, we're talking birds. If you'd like to join us, one 774 with a question that you'd like to put to Sean Dooley. Hi, Sean. Hey, Trevor. That's National Affairs Manager with BirdLife Australia. Tell me about the threatened bird index, because you've been doing a little bit with that. Yes, uh, I couldn't make last week because I was literally on stage uh, emceeing the launch of the National Threatened Bird Index update, which is a partnership between the um, uh, Australian government-funded uh, NESP sort of project, which is for funding research uh, into nature and BirdLife Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially, you know, at the um, they get Alan Kohler on at the end of the news and he talks about... He might talk about how, you know, NAB has lost 27 cents. By the way, that, that's not actually... It hasn't lost it. Either, so <laughs> don't get off the ledges. We're not doing <laughs> yeah. finance. So yeah, just yeah. Let everyone will yeah. tell you that right now. Exactly. But it does affect because it's such a, comparing that with the bird index. Yeah, and so instead of looking... Often I'll be on talking about particular birds, like, say, a swift parrot, which is mm. becoming critically endangered. This is a way of, of aggregating all the knowledge we have about all of our threatened species to see how they're going. And despite, uh, you know, a, a lot of citizen science happening there and research, we still, in terms of this threatened bird index, we, we actually can only use 72 species uh, of threatened birds because they're the ones that we have significant data sets, some going back to the 1980s, but all going back to at least 2000, where we've got like with like surveys, like it's literally hundreds of thousands of surveys. Um, so you can compare how the populations are going and then you aggregate that all together and you get the threatening uh, bird index. So how are we going? Not good. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, all that build up to, oh, <laughs> this is a bit of a dud. Um, yeah, it's, things are get, and things are getting worse. We, it was first produced. They said they couldn't do it because yeah. it was the challenge was put out that, that you just won't get the data. But... Thankfully, we've got so many amazing citizen scientists around who've been going out and collecting this data for decades. And there's the Brogas! Published about 2000. There's the Brogas, honey! The next iteration is still going down. So it's, overall, there's more than a 60% I love Brogas! I love you! On, average, on, on that, of that index. I love <laughs> populations, they, no. They've lost 7, I just love the process. percent of their population. And it's going down <laughs> on average 2.2% every year since uh, 2000. So it's kind of a, a scientifically valid quant quantification of what we already suspected. You would think, though, given that we have all of this information and that we're aware of mm. what's going on, it's still going down. Yeah, and the, the real bitter irony of, of the whole thing is this data set for the index only goes back looking to, to the year 2000. Uh, because that's when we have done all of those 72. For some of the birds, like the migratory shorebirds, we've got information going back to the 80s. But just for this purpose, um, going back to 2000, which ironically was the year that the first national nature laws were passed uh, under the Howard government, the EPBC Act, which we thought was going to really improve the situation. But clearly it's not enough because it's been going down 2.2% every year since. So it just further emphasises that need that we actually, if we care about saving our diversity of birds and by implication all of our natural wonders, then, you know, we, we need stronger nature laws that actually are more effective. And these are all natives, I mm. presume? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, it's, and it's all the ones that are categorised as, as either near threatened, uh, endangered, vulnerable, or critically endangered. Person. Does that mean that we've got an increase in the crap ones we don't like, <laughs> and then we've got a decrease in the native ones that we do? Uh, potentially, in some ways, there, there are some winners, and we see that through things like the Aussie bird count. Yeah. And, other things. So we know that things like the, the rainbow lorikeet and noisy miner keep going up as we build cities that, that work for them. Uh, we know that the, the it's interesting, the ibis, uh, the, the dreaded bin chicken, bin chicken, is climbing up the top 10 of the yeah. bird count. But oh, overall, look at glass! What's happening is that it's moving. And it's just a range bird. from the Murray Darling, where there's like a whole bird. lot of water birds. And we could only include one water bird in the national bird threatened bird index because we didn't have a good enough data sets for them but but we know from other studies most of our See where that white car is? Because of that happens drought, to be my favourite tree drought, here because you can get under it. It's like a little cubby house tree. Like that for, 
for 50 breeding <laughs> events frequently enough. So the ibis, unlike a lot of the other birds, which are really declining, they've shifted, they've gone, we're going to head to the coast, we're, we're going to be climate refugees coming to the city, there's lots of tips and rubbish bins and, you know, sausages in little kids' hands that we can snatch the food from. Not necessarily great for the long-term health of the ibis, but they're, they're adaptable. They've actually worked out a way to survive. Do you know, it's interesting because you mentioned water policy then. I've never considered water policy as far as birds are concerned and the issues associated. We should yeah, talk about it. that mm. on another occasion, how water policy does affect their birds. Yeah, and... Uh,